This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagardere broadcasting from the International Bariatric Club Studios in San Diego, California. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery exclusive event is Surgical Glues, Sealing Excellence in Bariatric Surgery. And we'll feature experts from the United Arab Emirates, the United States, Italy, Germany, India, Poland, Austria, Chile, the United Kingdom, and Saudi Arabia. We would like to thank our partners, Zoom Video Communications, YouTube, Facebook, Bariatric News, Cinemed, and Explorer Surgical for setting up, promoting, and accrediting this webinar, which is sponsored by our platinum sponsors, Ethicon Endosurgery, ConMed, Medtronic, Reach Surgical, David Medical, Lexington Medical, Easy Surge Medical, CMR Surgical, Panther Healthcare, Fulbright Medical, MindRay, our gold sponsors, Stryker, Arthrex, fit for me WL Gore, Carl Stortz, Bariatric Solutions, Advanced Medical Solutions, Liquiband Fix 8, our silver sponsors, USGI Medical, Mass Bariatric Technologies, Richard Wolf, our bronze sponsors, Boringer Laboratories, Intuitive Surgical, Baxter, Apollo Endosurgery. This is the 49th webinar of the IBC Oxford Academic Series that has over 3 million unique downloads and is streaming live to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, and via IBC Instagram. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Kwaja, consultant bariatric surgeon and co-founder of the IBC and director of IBC Global Education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London and Christ Church Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Professor Safwan Taha from the United Arab Emirates and will be moderated by Dr. Christian Steer from Germany and Professor Carl Miller from Austria. My chair today is Professor Safwan Taha from the United Arab Emirates. He is Consultant Bariatric and Metabolic Surgeon, Director of the Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Center and Medical Director at MediClinic Airport Road Hospital Abu Dhabi in the UAE. He's also Governor of the UAE Chapter of the American College of Surgeons and Governor at Large Board of Governors of the American College of Surgeons. I will now pass it on to my dear friend, Professor Safwan Taha, to present our moderators. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ariel. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Thanks a lot for the invitation. And thanks a lot for the great uh, efforts that IBC, yourself, Harris, and uh, everybody there uh, uh, extends to the world, actually. So uh, uh, without due uh, uh, waste of time, I'll, I'll introduce our uh, moderators. And uh, both of them actually won't, won't really neat introduction, but just for the sake uh, of, of uh, acknowledgement of the efforts, and there's somebody who doesn't know them yet. Uh, they are the esteemed Dr. Christine Steyer from Germany. She's head and consultant bariatric surgeon, Sano Wisti Center, North Rhine, Westphalia, Germany. She's member of the IFSO Bariatric Endoscopy Committee, and she's an editorial board member in obesity surgery. And uh, again, my uh, the other esteemed uh, 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 member is uh, my dear friend, Professor Carl Miller. Pro Carl, I mean, uh, he's been everywhere, bariatric surgery over the past uh, um, more than more than a decade. I don't want to make you sound old, uh, uh, Carl, but, but thanks a lot for all your contributions. Carl is Professor of Surgery at the uh, Diakonsen and well, a private hospital, Salzburg, Austria, and he's, he was president of EFSO 2010. Uh, uh, to 11 and if so, 2015 World Congress. Back to you, Ariel. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for that great introduction. I'm gonna pass it on now to Kristen Steer so she can present our first speaker. Thank you so much. It's my great honor to introduce now Professor Mirto Folletto from Padua, Italy, who is an adjunct professor of surgery and tutor and proctor for residents in general surgery and internal medicine at the University of Padua. And he is director of bariatric surgery unit at Padua University Hospital, Italy. And he will present today on the topic cyanoacrylate glues in bariatric surgery. And he is answering the question whether there is a clinical benefit. So Professor Folletto, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Christine. And uh, I hopefully uh, I'm gonna have give you some hints and clues regarding this uh, 
a little bit neglected maybe topics and uh, can you see my slides okay now you can see them uh, this is my, my small disclosure that uh, you already mentioned. I, I am go I'm going straightly through the agenda. We are going to say something about cyanoacrylates, something regarding internal hernias, something regarding uh, uh, slavic gastrectomy complication, and uh, showing you two small video clips regarding my personal experience with this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, cyanoacrylates have been out in the uh, medical market for more than 20 years and, and are very, uh, and here are three examples of the, I think, for, at, for my knowledge, three of most used makes that are available on the markets. And we can say that uh, they have a wide uh, in, employ in uh, medicine and also in general surgery, as you can see uh, from this table, that is from liver resection to you know uh, more superficial uh, pathology to to some 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 kind of very difficult and challenging issues. Some references uh, there are there's been somebody who has been trying to use. Uh, uh, cyanoacrylate instead of the sutures and also uh, and just to replace the suture to, 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 to make anastomosis. But uh, there's, uh, as you, you saw before, there has been a lot of uh, maybe uh, papers regarding the use of uh, some kinds of cyanoacrylates. Uh, this one is the one that I must, I'm most familiar regarding topic treatment of uh, fistula and, uh, and some uh, combined treatment regarding fistula. And th there has been also some uh, matters of publication that are available, but it, the literature is really scant. I just want to focus on uh, this kind of uh, cyanoacrylates that I know very well. And it is the only one that is a co-monomer. That is to say, uh, it has two monomer of acrylates uh, are combined together and it, this is I think the second uh, uh, generation and it has been in, in approved for internal use and uh, it is like a suture and once uh, polymerized it, it is a uh, completely inert biomaterial. In particular if you go through histology you know, can you see it is completely reabsorbed within at least 30 days. And this is the, the cells, uh, the, the inflammatory cells infiltrates that uh, are, uh, can be seen in, in, in this kind of uh, slides. And uh, according to the different substances, there is also a slight difference in infiltration, in cell infiltration. But we must say this is, this is a, a, a product that has been on the market for at least 20 years, but it was at, at the first surgical medical device of synthetic origin approved for internal use. The, the advantages is, are that it is ready to use, it doesn't to be storage uh, in the fridge. And once, once it is open, it does not polymerize uh, immediately in presence of air that is quite different from other cyanoacrylates and, the, and it can be safely stopped for another 48 hours and the polymerization another another issue is the temperature of polymerization that can be can hamper the tissue the surrounding tissue but you know this is paradiologic temperature so we don't have uh, any any issue and any uh, concerns and the other the other thing that is really uh, advantageous for this kind of product is that it has a great elasticity it's like a, a film that you are just putting all around the the tissue that you want to uh, treat the other features that has is this not worth it, it has is that it has a heightened cell strength that is much higher than any other internal pressure, but it has also sealing properties. That is to say, uh, it is uh, uh, repellent and also with bacteriostatic properties that are expiring within uh, seven days. And after five to six months, you can't see any, any trace of it in the tissue. 
moreover, this can't, uh, the, you can say that this doesn't prevent the, the regular uh, wound healing. There are some uh, devices and dedicated devices just for the laparoscopic application. And the application uh, in, uh, in surgery uh, is the widest that you can imagine. Why uh, talk about uh, this, this, uh, this kind of glue? Uh, when dealing with uh, bariatric surgery, because we know that uh, we have some risk of complication after bariatric surgery. The first one that I'd like to mention is uh, the, the, the risk of internal hernias and this very nice graph where you can see that if you're not closing mesenteric defect, you can, uh, you can have a risk of a substantial risk of uh, uh, internal hernias that, that that should be kept in mind. But you know, sometimes uh, closing the mesenteric defect can be really challenging in terms of uh, puncture the, the the vessels that are in the mesenteric leaves and 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 just uh, you know uh, provoking some hematomas in the, mesen the mesenterium. And this can be, be very tricky and also very dangerous sometimes. So why? We, we thought not to, to use uh, glue instead of uh, thread just to close the mesentery. The mesentery. And this is just uh, a very short videos. At the end of the gastric bypass, uh, what I'm doing regularly is just to glue in the mesenteric defect like that. This is a spray. It's, I know that the environment will be very foggy, but you are spraying it within the uh, abdominal cavity and, uh, just to, to, to have a, a look as the, 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 the efficacy of this kind of spread you, have, you need only to to grab the tissue and let just uh, up, up, just just oppose the tissue and then it's gonna keep the, the, the in place and the other thing is just closing the Peterson effect on the other side at, at the end and this is the, the closing of the Peterson, it's it's really easy to use. And, you know, it's very, very, very easy. So we can move to the other one. The other uh, application that we tried with uh, with this in mind was just to glue the uh, one of the most life threatening and also you know cumbersome for for the surgery uh, situation. That is the risk of uh, leaks in a slave gastrectomy. There are a few papers, one, uh, in, one I participated into, and it was, uh, I think, one of the, the, the few papers that were published regarding the use of a glue, uh, this kind of glue for omentopexy. And we should keep in mind that there are some uh, data that uh, um, uh, pose the omentopexy uh, a, a good, uh, I think, uh, uh, a good uh, mainstay just to uh, reduce the leak, the, the the leak rate, and this is why we uh, and we how we view homentopexy with glubran in uh, difficult tissues. This was a sleeve gastrectomy that was carried out in a patient after you know band removal. Can you see here the scar tissue regarding the 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 band uh, zone? This is the, the, the regular sleeve gastrectomy. We can move forward just briefly. The end of the sleeve, just after removing the, the, the tubules, we are just, just opposing the tomb with the, uh, the, the, the same cannula, spraying it, the, the, the glue over the staple line and just approaching the omentum to the staple line. And you can see it is very easy and also very effective, especially in the upper part, where is the most uh, risky zone for the leaks. As you can see, this was uh, an old video, but uh, here maybe you can see much better and with less fog, but uh, you can also apply these kind of films all over the staple lines. And as I said before, it is really elastic. So it's not so tough and so hard 
and uh, and also it's not getting uh, a, sh a bad shape of the ore uh, at the end of the sleep. So at the end of the day, I think that uh, although the literature is really scant and the uh, evidence-based medicine is really uh, parallel, very scant, there is a rational applicability for uh, this kind of acrylates. Uh, because acrylates were on the market and have been used in medicine for at least 20, 20 years. So uh, there is a strong rationale to use uh, uh, glues just for closing mesenteric defect because it is, an, I think it's uh, easy to do, especially if you are dealing with a, a spraying uh, device and zero almost zero risk. And there could be some uh, also uh, indication for homentopexy in sleeve gastrectomy, especially in the upper part of the, of the, the, the gastric remnant in, in terms of reducing the, the leak risk. Of course, larger series and longer follow-up are needed to confirm these early results, but this is my experience. And it has uh, been, I think it's a 10 years experience almost, and we have always been uh, doing like that, in, especially in Rouen wine gastric bypass. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm here just to, to, to take your question. Safwan, you're muted. Pardon? Sorry. Thanks, Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Professor Felito, for the uh, very informative presentation, the uh, multimedia and the videos, and, and of course, speaking, speaking within the time limits. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, 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 um, uh, looking at you, the way you are you were applying the uh, the glue to the to, to, to the Peterson defect, which probably, I believe, I mean. Well, I believe it's one of the major benefits of reducing this time and the problem and the complications and so on. But when you are applying it, we're not applying it to the two sides of the defect as if we were closing the defect. You are, you are applying it to part of the bowel against the mesentery. So uh, this fixation of the bowel to the mesentery rather than fixation of the bowel to the bowel would it be uh, wouldn't it be of a problems regarding the bowel continuity? Oh, thank you very much for your question. Of course, it was a, a video clip that was uh, spliced in many in many <laughs> many places. Uh, there is no problem if you apply also in mesenterium, such as it was in the mesenteric defect. And also, I just wanted to let you see if you. Uh, rise the, the 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 bowel you can spray it wherever you want otherwise if you wear some stitches uh, it's not so tedious i know it's not so time consuming but sometimes you must be very very careful to to avoid to have uh, the, the my major concern is just to get a nematoma in, in hematoma in uh, in the mesenteric lip and uh, just to let you see, uh, it, it is uh, a harmless uh, uh, glue because you can spray it uh, right on, on the viscous, and, uh, but it works also on the mesenteric leaves, just to, to let you see very briefly where you can spray, but you can spray whatever you want. Thank you, Christine. Oh. Yes, thank you, Stefan. I have a, a bunch of questions, Mirto. Very impressive. Thank you so much. The first one is a, a very practical, economical question. What's, what does it cost, this glue? In Italy, because I, I don't, this was a, um, a glue that was developed in Italy. I don't know about the international market, but in Italy, with the spraying applier, it is, uh, it is like a small bomb uh, bubble that, it, that you need to, to that is uh, sold with the, the, the product, it costs roughly around 100 euros. That is not that much, you know. In, it's just to, to, to make a benchmark, the, the cost of a reload, you know, it is about 130 euros. So mm -hmm. it's less than one reload. And if, if you consider also the cost of uh, uh, butter materials, that is, I'm referring to Simgar, it costs roughly uh, 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 the same price of the uh, one reload. I don't know about Germany, I don't know about uh, some 
some somewhere else in the world, but this is the cost for. So it's not that uh, expensive, and don't, you don't need any other um, source to, for application. It's it's just a, a, a very small small vial that does it is pressurized inside. You need only only to have a good competence with the scrub nails because sometimes if you have not to experience scrub nails, they can, uh, you know, uh, they 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 can <laughs> prepare the, the the solution not 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 adequately because you must make the right connection. But it's really used. It is really easy to use. And it's maybe uh, very reasonable if there is a, um, a liver in, uh, liver injury during the surgery, maybe. But I have another very practical question. Um, when you applied it, it was very foggy. Is this a problem for the camera? So that there is some, some glue to the camera? Uh, it, it is a problem that uh, you, you have a, uh, this solution that is sprayed. And I had, it, my residents were, uh, you know, uh, keeping the camera. <laughs> and this would be, I, I was operating residence only. That's why. And sometimes in the in the sec in the the first part of the video was made by the resident. So the, he was just approaching too much to the bubble. But anyway, you see it was not sticking too much. So I, that is to say uh, they, they need to get confident uh, with this kind of technique. Uh, sometimes this has some drawbacks. Yes, uh, you you should lower down the, the the pressure and also you should uh, this is that what the, the, the manufacturer says and suggests but sometimes you have no time so that's why you can see very foggy and we were using uh, i think a first generation camera that's why but you could see it does not adhere to the camera so it no 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 okay Okay. So, so your concern is about damaging the camera. Yes, no, no, yes, no. exactly. The, 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 the thing that you can not damage, but at least, uh, some, somehow um, not damaging, but you know, it can stick to the to the forcep. Mm -hmm. But if you put in into warm water, you can uh, uh, you you can unglue the forcep. It's like attack, you know. <laughs> the, the, once you happen to to have your fingers glued you have you had better to put inside uh, warm water just to to, to 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 have them unglued i think okay. thank you Mieto. i will pass it to charlie Miller. yeah thank you thank you christina because uh, everyone has only uh, one question the privilege only to have one question so glue brand uh, i know since uh, since very very long time i used it to fix um, uh, to fix uh, the mesh to the hernia. Yeah. And, and um, at that time, it was really strict. Don't use a glubran on bowel. So therefore, we really were very, very careful not to touch uh, the, the glue to the, to the bowel. Uh, is it really uh, approved to use it in trap terminal? And, uh, and uh, what is the disadvantage to use blue brown because uh, you you showed us only the, the the honeymoon things which which is great to see uh, I would appreciate to have a, a very easy closure of mesentery defect especially in very very obese patients so uh, that is from the legal part my question and from your side where do you see a disadvantage using the glue. So in, in Italy, this is Glubran, Glubran 2. I don't know if it was uh, something related to, to Glubran 1. It is, as I sh showed, uh, it, this is a combination of two monomers. I have no idea. I know that it was, uh, I, I know if you were referring to the, the first product that was available on the, on the market before. And, uh, and it is approved also uh, for... Uh, uh, st sticking the the, uh, the mesh now uh, inside the abdominal cavity, also the mesh uh, would can be in, in direct contact with the uh, the with, with the, the the bowel. This is what I know because they invented also another one uh, that is called gluta that is. Uh, uh, 
pushing some glues just to, to fix the mesh. The mesh. Uh, in, this, uh, in my opinion, I'm not so, <laughs> so confident that this can be uh, used instead of tuck, tuckers, but they said that it can be used instead of tuckers. As far as uh, the disadvantages, I think the disadvantages is the fork that you saw inside that, is, that can't, can, can, of the images can be better, but not that much than this. And, and the other thing is that you should uh, keep uh, a wider distance from the, the, from the bowel and also from the, the, the tissue that you are applying. As I told you, that these were residents were applying uh, um, the, the glue, they should, it should be at least five centimeters away from the surfaces just to have a more uniform spraying effect on, um, but we did not report any perforation and any dam and any uh, impair and any harms to the tissue up, up to now. And we have been using it uh, for uh, at least 10 years now here at home. Thanks, uh, Prof. For later, there are a few questions uh, and the uh, from from the audience, but I I believe that they all been answered. It's about in some obstruction or perforation, uh, which apparently is not happening at a serious uh, frequency, and about uh, the ability to close the Peterson and, and that you've showed, and about uh, in some obstruction and from your feedback. Uh, there is no such a risk, at least not statistically significant. So thanks a lot. Uh, I, I leave the mic now to Carl to produce uh, to introduce our next speaker, please. Yes, but I, I see that uh, Rudy Weiner uh, had raised his hand uh, since quite long a time, and Rudy always. Yeah, uh, sorry. Very, yes, very and uh, I also. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful. It's a, it's a task and a duty of the moderators. Uh, to listen with somebody like to have a question, not to ask your own questions only. Well, this is a, only just a question. Uh, is any any science, is a study, uh, is any real labs could be done? It works, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, the number of cases, is any control? It's just experimental design. This is a question. It's, a, it's an experimental design or it's a little bit science, a study or something else? As I stated in my last slide, there is a very few signs regarding this kind of uh, uh, substances that they have been widely used, especially in vascular fields, also in neurosurgical fields, but not in uh, the, the uh, at my knowledge, to my knowledge, no, no one studied the only one that was published was the one that we participated into, but it was regarding the aumentopexy in sleep gastrectomy. The, the randomized control trial it was very, uh, the numbers were very small. As I, I stated clearly in the la my last slide, there's a very few signs regarding this, this kind of approach. I, I, I told you that in my opinion, should, it can be reasonable, there can be some rational, but there is very, very few signs regarding it. Thank you. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of questions, and I think we are really running out of time. Maybe had, we, we have at the end of our meeting uh, the possibility, because it, it's really a, a very, very rare, uh, let's say, scientific uh, background on, on, on glue brown or on this. Uh, so it's quite the opposite when I, when I have uh, to announce uh, Dr. Bruno Sensi, who represents uh, Professor Paolo uh, Gentileschi who is um, uh, associate professor at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. And uh, Dr. Bruno Sensi is a fellow in the bariatric surgery unit. And we do have basically really good evidence when it comes to, uh, let's say, uh, fibrine glue. And he will uh, give us a, a lecture on uh, on, on that topic, stable line reinforcement during laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy using three different techniques. That was a randomized study that Professor 
Gentileschi uh, published uh, in 2012. But now uh, it's, it's your turn, uh, Dr. Bruno Sensi, please uh, give us uh, your lecture about the fibrin glue uh, in bariatric surgery. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And I would like to thank Professor Kwaja as well for the uh, invitation. And I'm very sorry that Professor Gentileski couldn't be here because uh, he's a bit of a pioneer in the, in the field. Uh, at least he was. And uh, uh, I'm sorry he couldn't be here and he brings you, uh, I, I bring his regards. And uh, so I'll start with my presentation. Uh, I have to share the screen. And um, so um, actually we, we will see, but the, there is definitely much more literature on the subject, but to a certain extent. So briefly, um, uh, the agenda of uh, my of Professor Gentileski's talk, which is uh, very briefly what fibrin sealants are, and then uh, their uses, their prophylactic use, uh, uh, both in gastric bypass surgery and in sleep gastrectomy, and their therapeutic use, which main, mainly means their application in uh, when complications of bariatric surgery arise. So just uh, very briefly, so what is um, what are the fibrin sealants? They're basically their products that have been um, on the market for a long time, a uh, number of decades now, and they were originally created as uh, hemostatic agents, basically. So they're made up of two main components. One is human thrombin, which is the last uh, cascade, uh, last factor in the coagulation cascade and fibrinogen, which of course is cleaved by thrombin into fibrin and uh, creates the clot. So the action of, uh, of, this, uh, of these sealants is of course to form a clot. Now the clot uh, tends to be sticky, so will be adhesive, and will also of course, and for this reason, they are considered sealants as well, because they will seal wherever they are, they are uh, applied. Now um, there are a number of different um, sealants in the in the um, in the market. I have highlighted here a few of the uh, most important ones used in bariatric surgery. Tiseal is the most used. There's Evisil as well, and then I've, I've highlighted this one, which is Flowseal, which is uh, technically is not an uh, um, it's not considered at least it's commercialized as a hemostatic agent only, although it is a procoagulant. Well, this is because it does not. Uh, include it is not um, it does it does not include fibrin as one of its uh, agents it is only um, made up of thrombin and the second component is a gelatin matrix that is um, very uh, um, elastic so that it can stick to any kind of surface but the end result is very similar to a traditional sealant because this matrix is made in such a way that it will trap Fibrinogen, uh, so endogenous fibrinogen inside its uh, um, its matrix. It, it, so therefore, uh, in the end, the thrombin contained in the product will create uh, fibrin um, nonetheless. So the final result is still a blood clot. And in fact, um, although strictly speaking, this may not be considered a sealant, it is uh, considered so in many studies, and it has been so considered in the relevant bariatric surgery literature. Um, so uh, we'll start with prophylaxis during gastric bypass, which are the, let's say, the older studies on the subject. And this was uh, probably um, uh, the first randomized, and actually the first and only randomized study on the, on the subject it was published uh, now uh, 15 years ago almost, with 160 patients on each arm. And the uh, primary outcome was uh, um, a composite of three different complications that can happen after bypass, which is the leak, bleeding, and internal hernia. And the composite endpoint was significantly reduced in the uh, interventional arm, so using the sealant. Uh, the conclusion of this study, though, is that larger studies will be needed to uh, confirm these results. Unfortunately, this remained the only study on the subject, at least the only randomized trial. So the next 15 years, we only have uh, other uh, non-randomized study. Uh, this is uh, a study which I, um, which we um, think is particularly relevant because it uh, does uh, shed a word of caution on the use of, of sealants because 
they are not completely without complications. So, for example, these uh, this group they have quite a number of uh, of patients, 425, which use the fibrin with the sealant, and they have uh, as much as 12, 11 percent of uh, anastomotic stricture in the long term, which is twice as many as in the no fibrin uh, sealant use. And another word of caution comes from another uh, study, which is um, which is uh, actually a, a case report of a different complication that seem to be uh, correlated with the use of the sealant, which is basically this uh, adherence of a small bowel to the uh, anastomosis where the sealant was uh, placed and uh, follow and the resultant um, uh, obstruction. Uh, so uh, there's much more uh, evidence on the use in uh, the gastrectomy. As I said, uh, Professor Gentilesi's group um, did uh, publish a few studies uh, some years ago, the most important of which was this uh, staple line enforcement during laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy using three different techniques. This is one of the first randomized trials on, on the subject again. The uh, downside is that there was only 120 patients with 40 patients per group because there were three different groups. One was uh, oversuing, one was the use of flow seal, which is we consider this uh, as a fibrin sealant and seam gird, which is a, uh, another substance that can be used to buttress the suture. And uh, it is important to note that there was no control group, so no one that had no uh, type of reinforcement. And the the main result was that the time to use flow seal was much uh, less than time um, to oversue the the staple line. But there was no difference in postoperative complications. This might have been due to the small number of patients. It might have been due to the uh, not having controls. We do not know, or just because it is like this. Um, another study, just a few years later, even this study had a, a, small, a small number of patients, another randomized by an Italian group. In this case, they did find a, a significant reduction in bleeding after, uh, after use of the sealant. But it is to note that the uh, group B, which is basically um, the control group, had quite a high number of, uh, of hemorrhage, which is as much as 14%. Different study, different results. From this other uh, um, study, there was no difference between the sealant and uh, no sealant, while a suture could actually decrease the number of, uh, of uh, postoperative hemorrhages. Uh, Another study, again, this was uh, a non-randomized, but we have more than a thousand patients. And the authors are very enthusiastic about this technique because they find very little bleedings and no leakages at all. Unfortunately, this uh, brilliant results could not be replicated in, in other studies. So there's probably more than, uh, than just the glue being used to achieve these results. Uh, probably some great surgery going on. And um, different last uh, one of the la uh, another randomized study again from a um, mainly Italian group and this time we have four different groups so we have controls we have the uh, sealant and two different sutures and there's no different in any of the endpoints which include the bleeding leak and stenosis and uh, this is the last randomized trial quite recent 2018 uh, very well published on annals of surgery again there was no difference but again, I would like to uh, note that the um, even in control group, there was very little incidence of bleeding, zero, very little incidence of hematoma, only 0.7%, and uh, only 1.3% of gastric leaks. Uh, finally, this is a very um, recent meta-analysis, 2020, and it's a meta-analysis of randomized trials. They found only nine randomized trials which include both uh, trials on sleep gastrectomy and the one trial I showed you before on uh, um, Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. And uh, they do find a difference as with uh, significant reduction of hemorrhage with the use of fibrin sealants. Um, to note is that there is no difference between use of fibrin sealants and suture reinforcement group. So it is, uh, it, it seemed to be uh, an actual uh, benefit when the, um, alternative is doing nothing. There is no benefit to, um, to suturing either than um, time. 
Now, the second uh, endpoint is a leak, and leak instead there was uh, again found to have no um, uh, no impact on the incidence of leak. Uh, just to uh, focus again on this point, these nine randomized trials used different uh, products. The first three were um, the classical fribin sealants. Last one was full seal. But these uh, products are probably uh, are thought to act in the same way, so they uh, probably can be considered uh, together. But uh, we actually have no head-to-head uh, -head comparison. We don't know how these perform um, either with respect to each other. With respect to each other. And the last um, paper on the subject is a different um, review, slightly less recent, 2018. This was just on gastrectomy leaks. And uh, it um, does compare different reinforcement types, including uh, the seal. And uh, they conclude that the absorbable polymer membrane is uh, the best technique with very low 0.7% of leak, which is significantly better than all other techniques. I won't get into the details of this because it's um, outside my presentation, but I just wanted to, to show you that the they only included, despite being a very, very inclusive study with many, many patients and many different kinds of studies, non-randomized uh, retrospective studies as well. And they only included 350 patients from the SEAL group, which is less than what was included in the same, um, in the meta-analysis with only randomized trials. So there's something missing here, probably. Finally, uh, another consideration is cost. And uh, not many studies focus on, on cost of the different options. Uh, the uh, study by Jens Tileski did, and it was only, of course, uh, um, uh, a very quick citation of this, but uh, oversuing only costs eight euros. Uh, and of course, here we have to think about also a bit of time wasted so that over, overall might be, um, we know that the uh, operating room itself is costly, so that might be a little bit more. But then we have the single group, which is 580, and flow seed is on only 120 euros. So it does have a cost, but it's uh, not too expensive. Uh, this is a, a quick clip, a very old clip, I think 2010, or how we uh, did apply the uh, flow seal on the staple line. And I uh, wanted to say that uh, now we actually uh, changed policy. This was during the study. So we did apply it to everyone or to whoever was randomized to this. Now we only apply this uh, selectively, uh, especially in patients who mm, for, for hemorrhage. So when we think that uh, the staple line is a bit bleedy, we don't uh, like it that much, and um, we do uh, uh, apply flow seal, um, which is quicker than suturing. When we have any concern for leaks, so for example, with a positive methyl in blue um, test, we go for suturing. We don't go for, uh, for flow seal. Now, the, uh, the final chapter is the treatment of, uh, of complications. This will be also uh, pretty brief. And uh, I'll only have one slide on the subject. There's a very, very recent uh, meta-analysis on, uh, on, on the subject. So we have, they review all kind of management of leaks and fistulas, including the um, most used, which, are, which is stenting, which has a very good um, result, about 92% success rate. They uh, review the over the clip, over the scope clip application, and another endoscopic um, the therapeutic modality, which is uh, exactly the uh, use of of um, fibrin sealants. Now the, we only have 10 case series in the literature, and they're very small series, so around six to eight patients each. So we have only 63 patients in the whole uh, lit worldwide literature, but we have very high success rates, around 98, 92. 0.8, sorry, to 100, which compares definitely compares favorably with the uh, clip application and more or less uh, the same results as uh, with stenting. Of course, there is being uh, there is less experience on the on the on the on the mat. Another point is uh, while stenting is usually used once and then it is removed, that there is uh, only around less than half of patients will be cured with uh, one application of the of the glue, but many will need two, three, five, sometimes up to nine sessions. And uh, complications are few, only pain and fever in 12%, so uh, there should be relatively safe uh, risk profile. 
So to conclude, uh, the evidence in general is relatively scarce with medium low quality. I mean, there are a number of RCTs, which is uh, absolutely good and very different respect to what we've seen for cyanoacrylate, but most RCTs are, are, are probably could be underpowered. They only have uh, a relatively low number of patients. And when we are dealing with hemorrhage and leaks, uh, and which have very low number, uh, very low incidence, they, uh, this could not be enough. And uh, in, in general, in any way, on the literature that we do have in the gastric by by bypass, its use may reduce overall complications, but definitely newer studies are needed. It's used in sleep gastrectomy in staple line. It, uh, probably helpful to reduce postoperative hemorrhage, while there is no evidence that it has any effect on leak. And finally, in the treatment of complications, it, it appears to be a safe and effective method. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sensi. Uh, that was really a highly professional uh, presentation. I, I super appreciate it. And Thanks. what we know from, from statistic is that the more patient you have, uh, the more or the, the rather you get uh, statistic significant. And uh, this year uh, from, uh, from Taipei, Taiwan, uh, a meta-analysis with 2,100 patients uh, brought up at obesity surgery where they found a significant uh, 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 result in favor for using fibrin glue. But uh, from the health economics, I do not want to talk. You, you really was very, uh, I say, very realistic. But are there patients where you would use routinely uh, fibrin glue, like uh, uh, high-risk patients, multimorbid patients, super-obese patients, or any patients uh, where you say, in this case, I would use routinely uh, fibrin glue. Well, okay, well, um, first of all, of course, I, I have to say I don't have the experience that Professor Gentileschi has. So, uh, of course, is. <laughs> my answer will not be as, um, as good as it might have been. And um, from uh, we, what we do in our, our practice, what I've seen this uh, year with him, we basically do not use it routinely. We do not use it routinely. It's uh, very much based on, on, um, on, on what we have uh, on interoperative uh, findings. Of course, if we do know that uh, there's a patient with a, uh, um, with some uh, who has been uh, taken aspirin or uh, uh, has any other reason, of course, to, to have a, a higher bleeding risk, we uh, definitely, uh, we might consider it more. Uh, we have to give it a higher consideration, but it's uh, not going in, in, in a routine. Uh, Thank you. Carl, Carl, Carl let, me, let me interrupt, has, Carl, um, for yes, a second. Yes, yes. And uh, I want to present uh, Professor Alan Saber from the United States. Uh, he's professor of surgery at Rutgers School of Medicine in New Jersey. He's also uh, Academy of Master Surgeon Educators in the American College of Surgery and Site Visit Surveyor of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Accreditation and Quality Improvement Program, which is the MBSA QIP. Uh, for the American College of Surgery. He's a surgeon champion improving surgical care and recovery uh, at the American College of Surgery and director of bariatric and metabolic surgery at the Newark Beth Israel Medical Center in the United States, also associate editor of Obesity Surgery. And I want to invite him to answer the questions and help out uh, uh, Dr. Bruno Sensi um, with uh, your questions, Dr. Miller, Dr. Steer, and Professor Taha. I would I would uh, like to thank Professor Saber for <laughs> this uh, very kind offer to help me with this uh, task. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you, Dr. Ortiz, for uh, uh, introduction and Dr. Harris for uh, invitation. And really, uh, uh, both Dr. Cynthia, Dr. Gentle, she have a very nice uh, screening of the literature about uh, fibrin uh, sealant in bariatric surgery. And across the board, we do know that uh, at uh, fibrin seal can help with increased bleeding, but there is a controversy about leak, uh, whether it helps uh, decrease the leak or not affect leak, or even some uh, articles talking about stable line reinforcement even can increase uh, 
Jali. Uh, I routinely use uh, uh, two uh, uh, materials, uh, fibrin sealant, uh, which is a T steel. As you know, it has two components, fibrinogen and thrombin, and it acts on the final step of coagulation. So regardless of whatever happened in the upper part of the cascade, it is still can work by providing the two substance essential for formation of the blood clot. So if the patient has uh, coagulopathy, patient on anticoagulant, uh, patient taking antiplatelet, still this material work. I work in the hospital. Uh, we are a big uh, heart and lung transplant uh, center. So many times I get patient need uh, preoperative um, uh, sleeve gastrectomy to qualify the patient for transplant. So be, to have a trans transplant, uh, BMI has to be below 35. So these patients are high risk patients. Those with ejection fracture of around like 10 or 12, taking the uh, dual antiplatelet and, uh, and the anticoagulation. So you need to do uh, the procedures quickly and also have like a confident uh, hemostatic uh, agent. So in this high risk patient, yes, I use T-seal for two things not only to having good hemostasis, but also is take the sleeve to the retroperitoneum. This will uh, decrease the chance of having a sleeve get twisted or migrate up in the chest. Uh, the other thing also, uh, this T-seal has a sealant effect as you can, uh, as you mentioned, so I apply it around the anastomosis, gastrogen anastomosis in high-risk anastomosis uh, patient. So I, if I do IC, ICG and I found uh, there's a little bit of ischemia, uh, especially at the mucosa, not outside, so you don't know whether this mucosa ischemia will progress to full thickness ischemia or not, I, uh, I wrap the high-risk anastomosis with the omentum and also I use a uh, sealant material that uh, TC. It also uh, reinforces uh, perforation repair, perforated margin ulcer, or peptic ulcer, and also I use it for uh, leak. The other uh, substance I use, I use uh, flu seal for bleeding. And I can tell you, I use it for a difficult situation. You have a sleep gastrectomy that migrate up in the chest, you need to bring the sleep down. And you can have you have to have an extensive media sinus dissection to bring the junction below the diaphragm. If you get a bleeding in the media sinus, I apply it to the seal. I apply it also inside the GI tract. So you're doing gastrostomy and you look at the anastomosis before before you closing the defect. If I'm bleeding from stable line inside the the gastrostomy, say I can put intraluminal the flu seal uh, by some conversion, it does help. So uh, it's very good material for high-risk patient, whether you apply it intraluminal, extraluminal, for both hemostasis and sealant uh, material. Regarding the cost, if you think about it, uh, there are tips and tricks how to decrease the cost. Uh, for example, for two seal, I use only four cc, not eight cc. But I use the, the spray system that can uh, spray the four cc to cover a, a big area. So by doing so, you cut down the cost into half. Also, uh, using this material that decrease the bleeding or minimize the leak will indirectly save you money by decrease the hospital stay, decrease the chance for transfusion or reoperation. So we need to look globally at this, uh, at this uh, material and see uh, which patient need this material and how this can affect uh, uh, the patient outcome. And I'm ready for her to help with any uh, question. I think, uh, uh, thanks a lot, Professor Saber, for this uh, very informative uh, 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 discussion and uh, explanations. I, I don't know. I you are, you answered actually two of my questions. Uh, 
I mean, the two questions that I had. I don't know, Christine, you have a question? I have uh, one very, very short question. Uh, okay. I'm very, very much used to fibrin glue, uh, but here in Germany, this is a blood product and uh, does underlie um, the rules and regulation for um, such products. Uh, and if you compare the fibrin uh, with the acryl, what do you think? Which advantage does it have? Um, and do you think it's a disadvantage that this is a blood product in comparison with the other glue? I have no experience, you know, with this uh, cyalo uh, acrylate uh, glue because in the US it's approved only for skin closure, the dermabond. So I use it for dermabond, but I don't use it in internally. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Anything? I mean, I, I guess that uh, in any case, cyanoacrylate is used basically as a sealant, but uh, doesn't really do the hemostasis. So the fibrin sealants have both both uh, both uses. So the that's where the advantage is where you think you you want to have like uh, something that is both hemostatic and might provide some sealant effect. Thank you, Bruno. By the way, it was a brilliant presentation. It was. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ajmel, uh, very quickly, you have one question before we go back to Professor Ariel for, uh, to continue. A very quick thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, great talk, uh, Dr. Sensi. Uh, my question is regarding the article that you uh, mentioned where there is twice an increased risk of gastrojejunal stricture or anastomotic stricture. And I wanted to get an input and see why you think uh, the fibrin sealants cause that twice the risk of uh, anastomotic stricture. Is it because of increased collagen deposition and increased external inflammation? This is, uh, of course, something uh, purely speculative. So we, we don't have uh, uh, the, the, the answer. And of course, uh, there, is, um, there is the only study showing this increase. And if, it definitely might be due to uh, more, infibration, uh, more inflammation and fibrosis, and therefore stenosing of, the, um, of the bowel wall itself. Uh, or I think it might also be due, for example, to uh, external compression, maybe, because um, I'm not sure if the uh, all those patients in the study were uh, a real um, uh, parietal stenosis, or there was some, uh, some maybe very very tight adherence from the outside, and so on. Um, yes. <laughs> Dr. Sensi, how long does it take to absorb the fibrin sealant? Uh, the, the fibrin seal. Well, we usually use flow, flow seal, as I said. It is uh, very fast, so we we apply it in um, some four five minutes, and then um, after like the the application itself, you'll have to wait for another couple of minutes and to um, tap on it a little bit with a, with a, um, with a gauze, and after so let's say maximum seven eight minutes, this is done. Actually. Uh, the, this kind of um, seal we use, which is flow seal, uh, you can you can um, after this is um, so after those minutes of application, you can actually wash it away because most of, most part will will be washed off and only the the part that is actually doing its uh, its job will stay stuck on the on the staple line. But um, and then the actual re complete reabsorption. Uh, I honestly know, don't know how many minutes or hours, but uh, if you, if, when we do, sometimes it happens that you reoperate on uh, on these patients uh, next day, or uh, it's it's usually gone. Thank you very much, Mr. Sensi. Thanks a lot, everybody. Back to you, Professor Ortiz. Thank you, Professor Taja. So uh, let me start by saying this is a popular and, of course, somewhat controversial topic. Uh, so far, we have over seven thousand viewers online. Uh, viewing live. So this is very important. I want to thank our panel of experts and of course our moderators, our chairman today. Uh, one of the things we believe at IBC is fellowship and academics as you all know, but one of the other things that we believe is in partnerships with, and uh, with industry simply because our synergistic efforts are going to lead to the ultimate goal which is patient improving outcomes. So uh, I want to take these next three minutes uh, to present Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor.
Today we have Guy Miller from Advanced Medical Solutions. All right, tell us a little bit about the product. Um, Liquabam Fix 8 was the first device to be developed. Um, laparoscopic delivery of cyanoacrylate adhesive with a fixation of mesh in inguinal hernia repair. It's designed to deliver specific drop of 0.0125 grams to the location of the mesh, where it then bonds the mesh to the tissue intended as a replacement for the spiral tank. Um, polymerization occurs by coming into contact with moisture in the tissue. The adhesive turns from the liquid into a solid and bonds the mesh to the tissue. As mentioned, the cannula length is 355 millimeters. The tip is specifically designed to not bond to, to mesh or to tissue and to allow the management of any, any polymerized material at the end. The adhesive is held in a glass ampule in the blue lever. The lever is pulled back to break the ampule, where the adhesive drops down into a little reservoir here, and is pulled into the delivery syringe by pulling on the red tab. This pulls the adhesive through a filter, which filters out any glass, ampule, glass material from the ampule, and then you close the blue cover to make it in line with the steel cannula. Remove the rear red tab, rotate, blue dial at the back until the trigger is released. That's pushed the adhesive down to the end of the cannula and you simply press the trigger to deliver your adhesive drop. Wonderful. And I understand you have two types, one for laparoscopic, one for open. So this is the Fixate open device. Again, no steel cannula this time, but we still have the tip that won't stick to mesh or tissue. Um, again, the difference here is the tip is projecting the adhesive to the site. Um, to make it easier for those blind applications um, and the tip will re remove a ball so you can then close the topical tissue, topical wound. The main difference here at this time, the ampule is at the back of the applicator and it's a simple case of rotating the tip to break the glass ampule. Again, you can see the adhesive drop into a reservoir. You then push the plunger to transfer the adhesive to the delivery syringe, rotate that to close off the delivery syringe, and then you rotate this dial to prime the device. And again, this time, you're just simply pressing the adhesive trigger to deliver the glue. To find more information about your product and your distributors, where can uh, our viewers go to? Well, if you go to our website, um, www.advancedmedicalsolutions.com, there is a specific portal and page on our liquor band range of both top and internal adhesives and specifically there's a section there for liquor band fixate. Um, you'll be able to find links to informative videos and instructions on how to use the device but also on how to contact the company directly to, to purchase the device. Wonderful. Guy Miller from Advanced yeah. Medical Solutions. Thank you for being on Spotlight on Industry. All right, and that was Liquiband Fix 8. And let's go back to our expert panel now. And uh, we're going to introduce our two chairs, uh, Professor Alan Saber from the United States and Professor Christine Steer from Germany. We have introduced them uh, earlier today. And they will be introducing our expert panel. Uh, all right. Uh, the first uh, expert panel, Dr. Flavia Soto. Dr. Flavia Soto is a bariatric and minimally invasive surgeon, Southwest Florida me metabolic and bariatric surgery, uh, Vincent Regional Health, in Vincent, Florida, USA, former division chief of bariatric and MIS and chief of surgery at uh, Sunny Upstate Community Hospital in Santa Cruz, New York, US. Uh, next on the panel, uh, uh, Professor Ralph Weiner from Germany. Thank you, Ralph, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Weiner is a professor of surgery at John Wolfgang von Koch University of Frankfurt, Germany, founding president of Germany uh, Society of Bariatric Surgery. If so, European chapter president, uh, 2010, 2012. If so, president, uh, 2014, 2015. 
the present EFSA Award Congress in 2011. Uh, we also have Dr. Saeed uh, Jamal uh, from USA. Uh, Dr. Saeed is Assistant Professor of Surgery, University of Arizona and USA, Associate Program Director of Minimally Invasive Surgery and Bariatric Surgery Fellowship, and Director of General Surgery Residency and Robotic Curriculum at University of Arizona, USA. We also have Professor uh, John Barry from UK. Dr. Barry is a consultant, laparoscopic bariatric surgeon, and professor of surgery. He's the founder of Walsh Institute of Metabolic and Obesity Surgery, Marston Hospital, Walsh United Kingdom. And we have also Dr. Marcus Belly from Shelley. Uh, Dr. Barry is um, Met, uh, bariatric and Metabolic Surgeon, Clinica La Contes, San Diego Shelley. He's a former Chief of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery at Clinica La Condes, San Diego Shelley. He's a pioneering bariatric surgeon in Shelley, having performed the first laparoscopic gastric bypass, gastric band, and duodenal jejunal bypass for selected diabetic non-obese patient in Shelly. Uh, Dr. Stern will uh, continue on presenting the rest of the panel. Thank you. Ariel, thanks for lifting me up to a professor. I'm not, I'm only a doctor, but thank you so much. So I'm going on uh, with uh, my good friend, Professor Ayd al Katani, who does not need any introduction. Uh, he's uh, one of uh, the most famous uh, operators uh, in Saudi Arabia, and everybody knows uh, his series of ESG. He's consultant of um, MIS and obesity surgery at King South University and director of King South University Obesity Chair in Riyadh. And he's uh, the chief executive officer and medical director of um, new medical center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Ayat. Then I want to introduce Dr. John Baker from the USA. He's an assistant professor of surgery uh, at the Division of Minimally Invasive and Bariatric Surgery at the T uh, Tulane University Health Center uh, in Louisiana, USA. And he's past president of the American Society of uh, Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. And last not least, Tom, Professor Tom Rugola, um, from Poland and the USA, represent a uh, repressed representing Poland and the USA. Um, he's, of course, and everybody knows, uh, the president and founder of IBC. Um, he has uh, the chair for bariatric and robotic surgery in Krakow, Poland, and is professor of surgery at Case Western Reverse University, Cleveland uh, in, in Ohio. Welcome, all of you. All right, let's go around and ask the panel uh, their expertise and experience and tips and tricks of using uh, glue in uh, bariatric surgery and minimum invasive surgery. Let's start with uh, Flavia. Uh, can you share with us uh, your expertise with using glue in bariatric and MIS? Hi, everyone. Uh, so I don't use uh, any of these products routinely. I use them. Uh, more of a PRN. And I have to say my first experience when I was just fresh out of fellowship. Uh, and I decided because of um, uh, to use a one time uh, fibrin glue just to reinforce my, um, you know, suture in my gastroenteric anastomosis. Two weeks later, it's anecdotal, but that was my start with the fiber and glue. Uh, you know, this patient came back with a bottle of traction. So that was uh, put me a little bit on the fence for a while, I have to say, as a starter. So I do believe that um, there is a big role for this uh, fiber and uh, glues and different products. Um, mainly for uh, uh, the sleep gastrectomies. I can see there is a big role. You know, you mentioned, Alan, uh, your experience when we have these patients that they are ready for transplant and we have to do a sleep gastrectomy, the two stage procedures. Uh, there's a role in those patients because we know that um, uh, they have um, 
their uh, coagulation, um, you know, is altered. So I do believe that having candid this arsenal of options um, in order not to make them bleed post-op, um, I think there's a big role for that. I'm not so sure about the gastroenteric anastomosis. If we uh, are confident about our techniques and the gastroenteric anastomosis, and we do, personally, I do uh, test this anastomosis uh, in two different ways. Um, I, I don't see much of uh, the advantage in my personal experience. Again, there's a role for, um, under my eyes and under my experience for more of hemostatic, hemostatic um, reasons more than um, to seal uh, in a fresh new uh, you know, gastric bypass. Uh, yes, I can see a role in, uh, and I see a future on this in potential complications uh, that was presented by Dr. Sensi. Wonderful presentation, by the way, you know, your, your mentor should be proud of you on this. Uh, you can share the video confident. Uh, so bottom line is I, I do believe uh, there's a, a big role for all this arcing out of um, uh, materials when we have those ugly complications uh, that they might come to our, our tables or, uh, you know, the endoscopic approach and sealants, I see that there's future in there. Other than that, you know, I, again, I, I keep those uh, things in my cards, but I don't use them routinely. So I have a question for you, uh, yeah. uh, Flavia. So you doing the gastric bypass, uh, uh, super, super obese, central obesity, big belly, male, and the leak test is negative, but there is a tension there, or there is a mucosal ischemia when, before you close the gastrogenostomy. What are you going to do for this uh, potential high risk patient that initially intraoperative leak test is negative, but we do know that patient can go home, come back in a week or 10 days with ischemia. Do you, do you do any tips and tricks to reinforce this high risk anastomosis? That's a wonderful question. And that was my patient where I used that five minutes that I was telling you anecdotally. <laughs> it, it did, it, it, you know, it, the, the leak was negative, but then I decided because he looked like a little you know, that kind of color that it puts you a little bit on, uh, you know, on the spot. And I used that and then it came back with a bile extraction, but it was not leaked, that for sure. Uh, so bottom line is um, a couple of things, um, you know, what we can, because sometimes you might have this discolorations from the outside, you can challenge yourself a little bit and put the scope. And sometimes you will be surprised how healthy is from inside. I don't do your routinely endoscopies, but I do my leak test with the tube, you know, blue and air. But yes, the endoscopy can be a wonderful, you know, option intra-op to see, to make sure the viability and how vital are your tissues, even though from my outside looks a little different. Um, and number two, you know, if you have a friendly momentum, you can always patch it the same way, you know, um, in the presentations where described to use, uh, you know, the five ring glues or the, the sealants and then put the momentum up top. You can always stitch a piece of momentum on top. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Philippe, yeah. next, uh, Dr. B uh, Professor Ralph Weiner. Uh, Dr. Weiner, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Can you share with us uh, your uh, expertise with dealing with high-risk anastomosis using uh, uh, fibrin uh, glue? We have an oil experience only just uh, in, uh, for uh, prevent bleedings, for, for gastric, as a prevention of gastric uh, leaks or gastric bypass or for sleeve gastrectomy, we never uh, used uh, uh, fiber, glue, or uh, such uh, uh, agents. This is for sure. But for bleeding, it's a, it's a, it's a clear benefit. Um, you know that uh, gastric leak, uh, this is a question uh, also of, of experience. And you know, maybe in a gastric bypass surgery, uh, after three and a half thousand uh, bypass surgery, it becomes extremely rare. Uh, this is uh, maybe you can have, um, really not a prevention, and they have a prevention by suturing. Uh, for, for the leak, it's also the same. Yeah? Uh, we have some belief that we can uh, prevent it, but the high pressure system uh, of the sleeve, uh, it's not a real prevention of, 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 of leaks. It's uh, the main focus in biotic surgery is bleeding, 
and uh, this bleeding, uh, this is shown, uh, the rate and frequency can be lowered by fi fiber uh, use. Thank you very much, Rodolf. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Said Ajmal to share with us his experience uh, with uh, glue in bariatric surgery and minimal invasive surgery. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored to be part of this esteemed uh, uh, panel. Um, I, I routinely use uh, fibrin glue. Uh, and when I saw the topic of uh, comparison with spinoacrylate glue, I was kind of surprised why I haven't heard of it. And I realized that um, in US, Cyanoacrylate glue, like Dr. Saber said, is only FDA approved for topical application. Um, I use fibrin glue uh, in my previous hospital. I used uh, Evacil, which is an Ethicon product, and uh, Tisil now, which is, a uh, which is a Baxter product. I also use Flowseal, and I use it uh, not only in bariatric surgery, but also in uh, minimally invasive parasophageal hernia repairs. Um, I also use it in cholecystectomies. I use Flowseal when there is a bleeding liver. Uh, bed um, and uh, and even uh, sometimes in perforated appies when I take call. Um, so my my experience with it has been pretty good. Uh, just like Dr. Soto mentioned, I did also have one episode of a small bowel obstruction at uh, the jejunal jejunal anastomosis. So after doing that, I stopped putting the fibrin seal at the jejunal jejunal anastomosis, but I still do it at the gastro jejunal anastomosis and I have not seen any increased risk of obstruction because of that. And I guess it's because in the left upper quadrant, there's uh, less likelihood of having a bowel obstruction because of that. Um, I think somebody mentioned the uh, cost and I, I talked to my rep about the cost. So in US, uh, one of the products that uh, is used is Evaseal. Uh, the cost of Evaseal for a four CC is $230. Um, it is uh, $475 for the 10 CC syringe. Um, and the applicator tip that's used for laparoscopic uh, use is about $80. So in, in total, it becomes of over $500. And uh, if you compare that with the other instruments that are used laparoscopically, for example, a ligature is about $400. So it's, it's slightly more expensive um, than uh, some of the energy instruments that are used. Uh, but I do see use of it. Um, I, I, I think that uh, it helps when there is a small amount of bleeding along the staple line, uh, which possibly can prolong a hospital stay for a patient uh, when we're checking their hemoglobins uh, and repeating them. And, uh, and in that particular case, uh, if, uh, if this fibrin sealant decreases uh, the risk of bleeding, um, then that's potentially beneficial. Um, I have two um, additional things that I wanted to mention I wrote down. Uh, one was that uh, fibrin sealants have a thawing time. Uh, and so it's important if you uh, don't routinely use them and you use them PRN to let your OR staff know beforehand. Um, to seal a uh, product needs five to 10 minutes of thawing time in warm water. Um, and so you should let your uh, staff know before you're finished. Um, Everseal uh, can be thawed before and can be stored for a month in a thawed uh, position outside the OR. And so if you routinely or PRN use it, you can have some of the Avaseal uh, available. Um, Thank you very much, Said. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go to the next speaker. We are uh, running out of time. So thank you, Said, for uh, sharing your expertise. So next, uh, I would like to ask the, uh, Professor John Barry from UK to share with us his uh, uh, experience and tips and tricks in using uh, glue in bariatric surgery. Well, thanks very much for the very kind invite. And I must say, I've, I've enjoyed some excellent talks uh, this afternoon here in, in South Wales and the United Kingdom. Um, I've been a, a convert to the use of this for about 12 years, and we've already uh, talked about the scant evidence behind using these products. Um, we started using this in my unit uh, based on anecdote. My colleague, Professor John Baxter, who some of you may know, had been to a meeting, the OSAN meeting, and he'd met a surgeon who'd done 700 sleeve gastrectomies using tissue reinforcement with very good results. So I uh, performed predominantly sleeve gastrectomies and gastric bypass, and I used tissue um, for, 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 for both cases. I've never used seam guard or over sewing. I don't like the idea of interfering with a staple line. Clearly, leaks are dependent on how good the blood supply is to the staple line, but we we always reinforce uh, using tissue sleeve gastrectomies. 
Um, the previous speaker quite rightly uh, touched on the te technical tips. It's very important that you get your scrub staff on board, that they prepare the product in a, a timely fashion. And uh, what I would say is that you, you need to be um, uh, applying at the correct distance at the correct pressure. And I think it's important that you apply it perpendicular to the tissue. So we use about 10 mils of, of tissue along the uh, sleeve gastrectomy staple line. Um, I always, re, uh, with my gastric bypasses, I do an anti-colic, anti-gastric, gastrojejunostomy with a staple linear back wall. I was very interested, Professor Saber, to see you use, uh, potentially using intraluminal uh, products. I've never seen um, uh, that used before, but I haven't run into any problems. And I will hand suture, laparoscopic hand suture the anterior wall, which is once again reinforced with tissue. And I also reinforce the jejuno jejunostomy, but I use the bi-directional technique, so I haven't run into any problems there. More recently, I would say the last four or five years, I've been using Tissial to close the Peterson's defect. It can be at the end of a, a lengthy operation, technically quite challenging. And I think um, applying Tissial on the cut end of the uh, cut edge of the meson tree does give um, you know a, a good you. effect. So I've thank been you, a John, we have just running out of time. Thank so uh, thank you for sharing. So next, Dr. Marcos Berry from Shelly. Can you share with us quickly in two minutes, please, your expertise with glue in bariatric surgery? Thank you very much, Dr. Saber. Thank you, ABC, for the invitation. Dr. Harris, my regards to Ariel and all the team. Nice to see you all. Uh, in South America, there's very limited experience with fibrin sealants. Most of us, either we oversaw the staple line or we use a SIM guard. Uh, there's almost no experience with sealants. The only experience we had was very limited for complications like chronic fistulas, sleep uh, leaks, and we bad experience. We didn't have a good uh, response uh, on that. Um, and also, uh, I think it's very interesting to see if we can use this in a prophylactic way to decrease bleeding. This is the number one complication for, for sleeps. Uh, I have a question for the, for the speakers, Dr. Sensi and Foleto. If you had had any uh, complications such as fever after the use of these sealants that we have seen that in case of complications uh, and if there's any explanation for that. Uh, I think to, to summarize, I think there's a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, would be interesting to compare if it is cost effective, it seems to be very cost effective compared with Simbar, but we don't have much experience in South America so far. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, Marcus, uh, so uh, going back to Christina, Christina, take over, please. Yes, I will. Thank you so much. I think uh, as uh, the three panelists, uh, we do it the same way, like Professor Saba did. We go from top to down, and I think it's a good idea that Tom has the chance um, to uh, be the last uh, speaker in this round. So I'll begin with Ayat Ayat. He was um, talking a lot about the N-luminal use uh, of uh, the sealant. Do you use um, fibrin or another sealant in endoscopy N-luminally? Uh, thank you so much, Christine, and thanks for everybody in this uh, panel and the team. Uh, definitely, I think it's I think one of the most important things to use at endoscopic dealing with the. Uh, uh, fistula, uh, like a leak post uh, sleeve or post other procedure. And I think what, to, what we have used it in some cases, we use it as extra tools. We uh, uh, coagulate the area, clean the area, switch it to the offer stitch and try to also utilize the fibrin glue at that uh, area. So I think it has an advantage there, though we don't have some sort of studies on that as an as a outcome. On term of our use in general, I don't use it routinely. And I don't think we can justify its use as a routine case cost effectively, because if we use it for every case while we have one person to leak or uh, bleeding is very rare, I don't think we can justify it. However, for those on anticoagulant, yes, we use it because that might help has been shown with uh, as uh, hemostatic purposes. 
and we use it maybe in revisional cases in some cases when we are not happy about the area or they are worried about bleeding, being a lot of dissection and things. Yes, we might use it at that level. And endoscopic, in addition to mesh fixation, like uh, uh, compared to uh, like uh, tackers, uh, considering the tackers with its complications and uh, pain. And I think the glue is less pain when those who are having mesh fixation. Uh, and that will give better outcome, in my opinion. So these are the things to make it short and, and to the point. Thank you so much. I, this is exactly my experience too. Years ago in Munich, I used it to glue in um, meshes in the inguinal area. That's, that's true. This is just much more automatic than um, to do it in another way. And uh, I also use it endoscopically in, you know, in leaks if there is a, a big abscess cavity um, to, yeah to clean it, to, to glue it, whatever. So, but let's go on. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your really, really big experience with that. Uh, let's go on to John Barker. Dr. Barker, um, you are an assistant professor of surgery and I'm sure that you are also used uh, in uh, applying uh, fibrin glue. Um, can you give us, or can you, um, tell us your experience uh, with fibrin glue in your practice. I generally use the fibrin glues in a very selective way, mostly for complications related to uh, abscesses uh, or enteric fistulas after complicated cases. Uh, most of these I've been involved with uh, are not amenable to endoscopic uh, injections and utilizing uh, interventional radiology to actually seal the fistula tracts once they've uh, collapsed down and uh, there's a very uh, narrow track that has worked uh, very effectively at trying to control these. These originally started out as large abscesses that were then controlled uh, with percutaneous drainage. I do not use it routinely on uh, staple lines. Uh, I have used Dr. Uh, Jawad's technique that he published in uh, obesity surgery about utilizing surgery cell new net uh, as a uh, buttress uh, to reduce bleeding complications uh, after both sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass. Um, the one instance I might use the fibrin sealant would be the patient that I had that is on uh, therapeutic anticoagulation, either with dual on a platelet therapy or NOAX, mm -hmm. that I'm uh, treating with uh, therapeutic Lovenox uh, and their bridging therapy during their surgery. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Very, very interesting and impressive. And uh, please forgive me, but um, time is nearly over. I would leave now uh, to Professor Rugula, Tom, it's so good to have you here, uh, the inventor of IPC. Um, would you just um, give, as I said before, last not least, your experience with glues? Which one do you use? Um, in which occasions do you use the sealant? Please share your experience with us. Uh, hi, Christine. Hi, everyone. Uh, my great privilege. The topic is excellent. I think we all have a great hope that the, the glue uh, one day will come and help us in, in the difficult situations. And we talk about mostly prevention. Um, and the reality is that uh, we're doing quite well, even without uh, those extra steps. The leaks and uh, bleeding rates are very, very low. Uh, so I'm not quite sure if we can uh, prove that um, the glues really help uh, in prevention those complications. So I would focus on, on treatment. So my personal experience is um, quite uh, long. Uh, we've been using uh, different kinds of glues back in early 2000s when I was a fellow with Phil Shower, and we did uh, quite uh, interesting experiments on, on pigs' stomach with Gianluca Bananomi when we perforate those stomachs and, and seal with glues, and it kind of worked. Uh, in many experimental studies like this, uh, the glue seems to, seem to work quite well. Uh, there's a recent uh, study coming from, I think, from France, if I remember well. Uh, this is a, a systematic review uh, of fibrin glues, uh, where uh, this is published in European Surgical Research uh, Journal. Uh, so interestingly, uh, based on reviewing uh, mostly experimental studies, that did not, that did not uh, confirm that those glues, especially fibrin glues, really help healing the anastomosis or any kind of perforation. Uh, the conclusion from the study was, it, yes, it helps, 
by a mechanical approximation of the tissue, but they did not prove that that really heals or help healing. So I think there might be fundamental difference between stitching or stapling and gluing, uh, where we know that staples and stitches, they help uh, you know, formation of uh, fibrosis. Why glues, we still don't know. Maybe it's a different mechanism. Um, Another uh, experience that I have uh, with um, with treatment of uh, complications is, is fistulas. Uh, I think Barry mentioned about successful treatment. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Baker mentioned about uh, successful treatment of, of the fistulas. So uh, in my general surgery practice, where we deal a lot of uh, with the different fistulas, um, it kind of work in an uh, environment that we already know it's going to work anyways uh, in situations when there's low output fistulas and, and there's no obstructions of any kind. In a simple fistulas, it seems to, it seems to work, but uh, honestly, uh, no, we don't see those kind of simple, easy fistulas very often. Usually they are very complicated. And in this kind of situation, I don't think it's very good uh, uh, solution as you, you may hope. Um, most recently, like last week, I applied some of the glues on uh, small fistula, and uh, it made uh, the, uh, the the the, um, the side pretty stiff and kind of fell off. So it did not heal. Um, uh, and uh, we did use um, different glues endoscopically with a um, group of student clinic and Phil Shower and other folks from there endoscopically. Uh, it seems to work. Uh, again, if, the, if other conditions of uh, healing the facial loss are in place. Um, my other experience is uh, with um, hemostatic agents. We, we kind of use uh, this just in the case, uh, I don't think we, pro we prove this with any scientific fashion that uh, those hemostatic agents really uh, help reducing bleeding. Uh, I think most of us, they, they use it just in the case if it's available, we just apply uh, just to double uh, uh, check or reinforce uh, whatever hemostatic um, uh, methods we use but I don't see any, any uh, scientific um, proof for that. And finally, uh, let me uh, share my, my own little experience uh, with sleeve gastrectomy. Um, I tried to use it uh, not um, applying directly on uh, the staple line, but uh, on imbricating the staple line, like we do normally uh, using um, a stitch and put the glue inside. It's kind of difficult to do uh, but uh, it seems like uh, makes some sense rather than exposing staple line and, and gluing. I just imbricate the gastric wall over the staple line and then glue it inside. Again, it, I'm very far from any conclusions, but this is my my experience. Uh, so let me conclude that uh, for prevention, I think it might be a little bit overdoing. Maybe we have enough uh, experience with other methods. They they pretty good. Uh, for treatment of uh, complications, uh, I still don't see uh, a strong uh, conclusions if this is really helped. Uh, one thing for sure, I use it all the time for skin and patients are super happy having no stitches and uh, it, it might prevent from, uh, from wound infection as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing and, and thanks to all the panelists. It's, it's always, uh, it's so enlightening to bring together such a bunch of experience. Uh, and I think uh, the auditorium will also enjoy this or had enjoyed uh, this. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, I will pass it uh, to Professor Sava and um, to, um, to Professor Taha to close the session. Thanks a lot. Uh, I enjoyed it so much. I learned so much. It was really a pleasure. Uh, thank, thank you Christine. very much for the for the panel and uh, best with Dr. Taha. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Saber, uh, uh, Dr. Christine. And uh, uh, this concludes our uh, very interesting uh, webinar today. Uh, many thanks to uh, Tom, Harris, uh, Ariel, and the IBC team for their uh, relentless efforts at uh, uh, improving the quality of care that we present through exchanging our ideas and our experiences. And thanks a lot for my uh, 
a wonderful moderators and panelists and speakers. Uh, I learned a lot from today's uh, webinar, and I hope our audience did that. Thanks a lot. Until we see you again, uh, I go back to Professor Ariel. Ariel? This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. Register to obtain CME credits for this and upcoming events at cine-med.com forward slash IBC 2021. To view the complete Hot Topics and Surgery series, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress has been rescheduled to September 19th through the 21 of 2022. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now, let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless. An active approach to hemostasis, exploring the coagulation cascade. Adjunctive hemostats may be categorized as active or passive. Efficacy of these products may be impacted by a patient's coagulation status. Hemostasis is the physiological process that stops bleeding at the site of an injury without forming clots elsewhere in the circulation. Vasoconstriction serves to contract blood vessels, decreasing blood flow to the injured area. A platelet plug is formed by aggregation of platelets, which also initiates the coagulation cascade. A platelet plug induces formation of a fibrin network by converting fibrinogen to fibrin in the presence of thrombin to form a clot. Upon achieving hemostasis, tissue healing can begin. Individuals who have a coagulopathy or are treated with antiplatelet and or anticoagulant medications may be compromised in their ability to activate platelets or form thrombin, risking greater blood loss. When deciding to use an adjunct hemostat, the patient's coagulation status, which can be impaired by medications, should be considered when choosing between an active or passive hemostat. Passive hemostatic products rely on platelet aggregation or activation, as well as normal formation of thrombin to achieve hemostasis. Coagulation must be intact. Achieving successful hemostasis with passive products is limited to low-level bleeding and is impaired by the patient's coagulation status. Passive hemostatic products include oxidized cellulose, collagen, gelatin sponges, gelatin collagen powders, or polysaccharide spheres. Active hemostatic products function independently of the patient's ability to generate clotting factors to achieve hemostasis. Therefore, active products are effective regardless of coagulation status. They can also achieve hemostasis over a broader range of bleeding grades. Active hemostatic products include flowables, which contain thrombin and gelatin, fibrin sealants, advanced patches with PEG or fibrin sealants. In addition to hemostats, Baxter's portfolio includes sealants that work independently of the coagulation cascade to mechanically seal tissue and prevent postoperative leakage. Baxter's portfolio of active hemostats and sealants include flow seal, to seal, hemo patch, co seal. Baxter's portfolio of active hemostats effectively achieves hemostasis over a wide range of grades across multiple surgical specialties and anatomies. Baxter's active hemostatic portfolio helps to reduce bleeding complications that can optimize operating room efficiencies to improve patient outcomes and reduce overall costs.